Congrats on the movie. I thought Thank you guys you. did such a great job. Oh. Especially because I read that the movie was made in 31 days, and I don't understand how you pulled that off. It's psychotic. I don't really understand it either. So if you learn and could tell well, us, we that do would be know, great. which is that Craig Gillespie never stops. He's rolling. a mad like, genius. Literally, he just yeah. says, and again and again, and there's no cutting ever. So we rolled for 31 days straight. That actually, yeah, that sounds about right. Actually, yeah. you know. Um, so one of the things about this is, like, I left the theater. Um, not I left the theater angry because it reminded me of things, and uh, not in a bad way. Like the movie's fantastic. I was just angry at um, how how uh, rigged the system is. Yeah, that's you know what so I mean. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so I wanted for both of you, what did you learn while researching all this about hedge funds and Wall Street that like sort of got under your skin that you really just want to tell people to remind them that the system's fucked. Yeah. I mean, I Sorry think for my it, language. No, I, I mean, we love it. Yeah, <laughs> we'll we look agree. At this movie about yeah. the little finger. I think first and foremost, just how opaque Wall Street is and how, you know, it's it's designed to be hard to understand. We, you know, we learned, we, we, had, we had covered finance for the Wall Street Journal as reporters before we were screenwriters, but there were all kinds of things we didn't know about, like the DTCC, which is a body that like regulates the whole stock market. Yeah, it sounds like a government body, by the way. The DTCC, it it's a not. subsidiary of the NSCC. Not and at fact, all. You know, like people don't even own the stocks they think they own. Actually, the DTCC does. But, you know, that all sounds very wonky. The point being, the system is not transparent by design. And I think that's part of what has led to so much anger about the system being rigged. And it's on Wall Street. It's also in Hollywood. You know, we're here as producers of the film, but we're also writers of it and part of the WGA and very proud that our union is actually trying is fighting for more transparency, which is the only way, you know, the only path back to fairness we feel like, whether it's in Hollywood or on Wall Street. Yeah, um, I could devote this entire I interview to uh, transparency from the streamers. Yeah. But I'll, so I'll actually, <laughs> Yeah, but, but I'll, I'll actually ask you, do you think, one of the things, do you think there's ever going to be full transparency? Because I think that the streamers are sort of hiding the hits and the, like, they don't want to, like, they don't want to report anything because then everything... It's very, man, this is a big subject. Yeah, I mean, light <laughs> yes, is. light is the best disinfectant, right? Like when it, the, the the why, anytime someone is holding information back and not sharing it, especially with the participants, with the people whose labor contributes to that viewership, you have to ask why. What? Why not share it? What are you hiding? Yeah, I, again, I could the whole, entire interview could be this, but let me jump back into the film. Yeah, you obviously only have two hours to tell the story, and you're basing you use the book as the you know the, the source mm -hmm. material. But how did you decide? what characters to focus on because there could be so many people that could be, you know, stories who could be told. So how did you decide where, you know, what it was, characters? Yeah, it was very hard. I mean, it was very important to us to show every side of the story, to, sort of, to show the Wall Street side, the retail trading side, to get into Robin Hood, to get into, you know, we had a GameStop employee who actually brought us into the store, played by Anthony Ramos. Um, and it was also, as we did our own research and really talked to people who invested in the stock and were on Wall Street bets, we were struck by the tremendous, you know, diversity of people who bought GameStop and were on Reddit talking about it. And it was important to us to really show the different kinds of people who invested. So we have, you know, America Ferrera's character, who's a nurse, um, you know, investing. And then we have the Roaring Kitties, you know, who have more financial experience. We have the college students. We have the the GameStop employee who became an investor in the movement. And, and all of those character portraits were drawn from interviews that Lauren and I did, in addition to what we read in Ben's book. We love Ben and the book is great. Um, but we met so many people and heard their personal stories. So not just looked at their balance sheets and saw how much they won or lost in terms of dollar figures, but really understood why as human beings they were compelled to join this movement, why they were angry, what they wanted, and how maybe they felt small before and how joining this made them feel part of something big and something important. And, um, and that's what we were excited to tell. So we wanted to try to capture, and you're never going to do it perfectly, but we wanted to try to capture to the best of our ability and with the limits of time, um, a good uh, array of, of experiences. Yeah, so we, had, we wrote characters that were actually cut from the script, but we felt like one way of bringing in the full movement was to have these TikTok videos that are kind of you know running through the movie as a chorus that are real, that we found in researching the film and we had them in the script as well, that sort of show other people in the movement and, and bring in those voices. There are obvious comparisons here and we hear them all the time to The Big Short, to Wolf of Wall Street, to kind of the class to the social network, the classic like finance and, and technology movies. But we also looked a lot at Frank Capra and popular the history of popular.
populist cinema and tried to kind of, as grandiose as it sounds, create a new language of populist cinema for this generation. And to us, one way of doing that, I mean, Capra was very effective at elevating a regular man's life into something worthy of the big screen. And one small way that we tried to approach that was was integrating at the script level real TikToks of real people who are part of this movement so that when you watch the movie, you don't just see actors playing characters who invested in GameStop for, for one reason or another. You see real people, dozens of them, who participated in this movement and, too. Yeah, and it felt radical to say like these people deserve the big screen treatment, but it also felt really right for the story to so make them part of it. One of the things that I was wondering is, because I remember when all this was happening and uh, do you, I wonder, and I'm curious your opinion, do you think if the pandemic hadn't been happening, if retail, if you couldn't trade on your phone, like it was a convergence of all these different oh, things perfect yeah, perfect that yeah. made it so people were yes. on Reddit and paying attention. Do you know what I mean? Course, well, it took yeah. things that have been happening in our world for a long time, right? People being more isolated, feeling lonelier because of the internet and social media. It took, you know, income inequality, which has already been a galling problem for a generation or more, and and ratcheted up times a thousand. So it was that the pandemic pandemic was kind of fuel on the fire that brought all of these things together and created the perfect storm. Right. It was that moment where like you would you would be doing a Zoom with your boss and your boss was at home and you would see they live in this huge mansion, right? People really saw how, you know, who had stuff and who did not for the first time. We tried to, you know, reproduce that. In the yeah, you see it well. in the movie who's wearing a mask and who isn't. Who's yeah. telling you to put your mask on yeah. um, and right. who's like grabbing a right. breath of who fresh air on the bus. Who rented out an entire yeah. firm, you know, entire resort to move their firm down to Florida, Ken Griffin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, true story. And who's stuck in their basement. No, uh, 100%. The other thing is I, I uh, while not obviously some savvy uh, stock person, I had Robinhood. And it was after what happened with GameStop that I ditched that app because yeah. I was so angry by yeah. what they did. Yeah. Well, yeah. and that's back to this transparency question, right? Because Robinhood advertised themselves saying like, you know, we have commission-free trading and it's free, but actually it's not free. And, you know, it's coming out, you know, you, you the user is actually paying for it in a hidden way. A hundred percent. Talk a little bit about when, for both of you, this is your first film. What is it like getting this cast in the movie? Because the, obviously it's like this all-star lineup of people. And <laughs> are you sort of like, uh -huh. like, have you thought about playing the lottery recently? <laughs> like, do you well, know what I mean? It's, yeah, it's, it's, our, it's our first produced yeah. film, but we've been working together as a writing partnership for almost 11 years now. Um, yes. So we've written a lot of movies. And in fact, we've worked with Seth Rogen quite a bit in the past, although none of those efforts ever reached the I'm screen. I'm with Craig Gillespie. This is our yes. third outing with Craig. It's finally the one that got made. But we could like paper the floor of this room with scripts, <laughs> with scripts. that did not get made that we sold. Um, but we feel very lucky. This is the movie that got made. And it's also, I mean, there aren't that many movies like this getting made, an adult drama with comedy. Like it's, you know, that we say that the closest thing to a superhero cape in this movie is the red headband <laughs> that Keith Gill wears. And so it's a miracle that this got made. And in order for it to get made, everybody had to take a pay cut. This wasn't some big streamer movie where everybody got a yeah. huge payday. Everybody believed in the story we were telling and they did it for a fraction of what they normally make and it was in order to tell it. Independently in New Jersey with a big tax credit. Which is how it got done. Well, again, like thir let's go back to the thirty-one days of shooting. Like yeah. that—that that is not a movie that has a lot of money. Like yeah. straight up. No, like, no. I, I mean, all yeah, the money's on the screen. Next. We didn't. Yeah. We didn't have a big video village most days. We would yeah. stand behind Craig at the monitor, and mm -hmm. um, yeah, he made, and again, he he shot the whole time basically to get every minute in there. I'm I'm curious with like Roaring Kitty, right? With something like this, did you actually get to talk to him? And like, how does it work in terms of like his life rights? Like, and using the story, did um, like you know what I mean? One thing that's great about Keith Gale, I mean, there are so many things that are great about Keith Gale, is that he's a really singular um, figure in that he is a reluctant hero. Um, we, it feels like we live in a time where everybody wants fame and attention. And here is a person who really believes in something and so brought his conviction to the internet, but didn't do it really for the money or for the attention, because since then he has lived such a private life. Um, so for us as screenwriters and as just responsible, like moral human beings. It was important to us that even though he became a huge public figure and with him, his family became public figures to a degree, we wanted to both respect their wish for privacy and also give them the opportunities that we would want if we were ever so lucky as to be in his situation 
to uh, to um, participate in the process. So, yeah, so we reached out to them throughout the process, and then we um, we you know drove to them and said, "We'll show you the movie if you want." Uh, we want to respect their right for privacy, so so we won't go into that anymore. But um, we will say that they are the smartest, coolest. Funniest, nicest, funniest people. Funniest it's people. It's very clear, like, Keith got all this, you know, from his family. From his family. They're, yeah, they're as extraordinary as he is. Yeah, okay, so I'm just going to say that um, I thought that everything about, because uh, I'm from the New England area, I thought oh, the depiction too. of Brockton, um, you know, and all that was great. My only complaint about the entire film, it's very Ooh. important. Ooh. Um, so the movie takes place in Brockton, but you do not have anyone drinking Dunkin' Donuts. Uh, <laughs> as a matter of fact, in the opening, the opening scene, shot. Keith wait. Gill on okay. the subway, his leg is jiggling, oh, and he has a, a Dunkin' Donuts I have cup. to tell you, because I'm from Boston, and I am addicted to Dunkin'. My mother got hypnotized for her Dunkin' addiction. So this goes way back in my family. And he even, he so even shot the mask I apologize. Down. You're <laughs> right. I missed the Dunkin' in that but shot. But you know what? I feel like you're, you're a real Boston person if, if that was your, you know. Your That's what you ball. noticed. But because any time a movie takes place in, in the New England area and, and yeah. characters are not drinking Dunkin', well, it's not real. We'll tell yeah. you also, when, when we went to go meet the Gill family, we brought them Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> By the way, as you should. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious, with the editing room, I'm not sure how involved, like, were you in the edit all to the time with Craig, but how did the film possibly change in the editing room in ways that you guys didn't expect? Oh, great question. We had an extraordinary editor on this movie, Kirk, Kirk Baxter, Baxter, yeah, who only does David Fincher's films, then made, made an, exception an exception for this. this. And it was such a complicated film to oh edit because there's so much real footage and um, that has to be kind of integrated in. But, you know, we said when we first started writing, we wanted the film to move like a bat out of hell, to quote the great Billy Friedkin. We and also wanted it to feel like the experience of being on social media, so fast and choppy yeah, this, and this, propulsive this. and energetic and where you really get caught up in it. Um, and in order to do that, it's not, you know, seven minute scenes, it's short scenes. And it's scenes where people who never met each other and never were in the same room, we have to show the way that community came together, the way they were bouncing off of each other, getting each other excited, confronting each other. And so to do that, you really need a kind of like overlay of scenes. So it's one scene jamming into the next. So the edit is, it is a, a lattice a work. It is a masterpiece. I think also the edit, like we would we'd go out every so often to see the cuts with Kirk and Craig and the film would get shorter and shorter and shorter. Uh -huh. And they'd be like, yeah, great news. It's down uh -huh. to one hour, 42 minutes and 37. Yeah, to us, one of the highest priorities of this was that you, you don't need to know a single thing about the stock market to totally get the movie and to enjoy it. So it was, a, a, I think one of the surprising things was figuring out how much to explain and how much to withhold. And I think we we erred on the side of just not getting into it, not bogging down the movie with a complex explanation right. of what call options are and how they work so that you can really, the, the thing that matters most is the emotional ride through this David and Goliath story. And I also think trusting the audience to understand like the basic mechanism yeah, that we're totally. explaining. Like we showed the film, you know, we did test screen in Oklahoma City and it was like the more we put in explanations I think people then felt bored or you know yeah and it, it actually is better just to trust the audience to go on the ride with yeah the I characters. think a lot of times movies water down everything to, to make it and then it, the audience is smarter than you give them credit for. Exactly. 100%. Yeah. And that's the whole irony of dumb money, right? Yeah. It's like that these actually are smart investors who are wearing this insult from Wall Street as a badge of honor. One of the things, though, because I, I think I'm, I'm running out of time, is what I think that the movement and what happened fundamentally changed Wall Street and uh, like the dumb money is no longer dumb. I agree with you. You know, and yeah. invisible people are no longer invisible. This is a community of people, millions of people that Wall Street treated with scorn if they treated at all, and now they will never be ignored again. And I'm sure Wall Street will love to say like, "Oh no, we're back to business." That's yeah. not true. But there are it was apps, a one-off. There's apps now that like track where retail investors are going to be trading. You know, people at the big hedge funds are looking at this. They're shorting less. There's all kinds of legacies from this, and the story is not over. You know, it's continuing. GameStop had earnings yesterday. So we'll see what happens. Well, that, that's the thing, though. I think that the short, the shorting going forward is is you can't do it because people are too smart now. Yeah. And you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah, short positions have have gone up and down since GameStop, but never reached the level pre-GameStop. Like people really, people really learned on Wall Street that a naked short sets you up for infinite losses um, and, and it's too risky to do anymore. Last thing for you. Um, do you think, do you know what you're gonna, what's coming up next for you guys in terms of 
producing or you know yeah, what I mean? We do. Yeah. We'll tell you one thing that hasn't been reported yet, which is we Love it. Um, <laughs> we have written a theatrical feature film version of Murder She Wrote. Um, for Universal, and we're really excited. Yes, it's with Pascal Pictures, Amy Pascal, and Universal, and we're very excited to bring uh, Angela, you know, well, yeah, Jessica, Jessica Fletcher back to, the, to big the big screen. Yeah. 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 Oh, I have so many follow-ups. I'm just going to ask you real fast. Uh, let me think about what my, my follow-up question is going to be. Um, is it one of these projects that Universal is gung ho on in terms of like? Have you already thought it started talking about casting? Are you or is it just the script just got they seem delivered? very excited. They seem pretty gung ho. Yeah. We would have told you if they weren't. We haven't <laughs> talked to them obviously in months, but because sure. um, yeah. it's a strange time. But uh, but I think know. everyone feels like it's you know it's Jessica Fletcher's moment to return. Yeah. I will leave it there and say I'm very happy for the two of you. Thank you. And Thank sincere you. congratulations on this Thank movie. You. Thank you so for much. Real. Those are great Thank questions. You. 